Is it just me, or do movies these days feel artificial? And I'm not just referring to unconvincing acting or graphical shortcomings. I'm talking about the whole experience, from beginning to end. Boring. On the surface, the Hollywood blockbusters of today still look and sound like they used to. And if you're watching them half asleep or drunk, you may not be able to tell that anything has changed at all. But I don't know. There's something about movies today that just feels off. Like they're missing something. And while I don't know exactly when it began, I do know when I started feeling it. Let me tell you a personal story. Growing up in the 2000s, it seemed like every kid had a favorite franchise. Whether it was Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Yu-Gi-Oh, Bionicle. But for me, the fantasy world I called home would be found in a galaxy far, far away. It may not be possible to describe just how big of a deal Star Wars was when I was younger. The brand was in the midst of a cultural revival for a new generation, my generation. The fanfare was practically inescapable, and boy did I get caught up in it. My first taste came from the LEGO Star Wars video game, and the rest was history. Star Wars became the first fictional universe in which I was truly engrossed. Studying the characters and lore became a personal obsession. It got to the point where simply seeing a dude with a glowing stick was enough to get me excited. And I was far from the only one to feel this way. It's impossible to truly describe just how much of a cultural phenomenon Star Wars was at this time. And unlike many such events today, it never came off as forced or contrived. The intense passion around the series came from a place of genuine reverence, one that transcended space and time. These days, boomers and zoomers aren't exactly known to get along, but for a brief period, Star Wars managed to bring us together. I still have fond memories of watching the original trilogy with my dad and recognizing that it was a meaningful experience for both of us. I figured that one day, I would be able to pass on a cherished trilogy of my own. Unfortunately, like most things in the modern age, it came with a catch. Oh! It turned out that the new batch of Star Wars films didn't quite stack up to the originals, and that George Lucas may have gone too far in a few places. I may have gone too far in a few places. As time went on, I began to realize just how flawed the prequels were. Despite my overwhelming love for the franchise, I couldn't ignore the sinking feeling that I'd been shortchanged. I mean, after all, for as pervasive as the Star Wars brand was. At the end of the day, it all depended on the success of the movies. So with that being said, is it too much to ask for the movies to be, I don't know, good? Passion and hype can only get you so far. At some point, the underlying product has to be something worth celebrating. It's tough to justify being a fan of a franchise when half the films are downright mediocre. But no worries. Disney has come to save the day from that washed up hack, George Lucas. Just look at how they turned around Marvel. This thing is gonna be a slam dunk. They're gonna come in, kick some ass, and make their own trilogy the right way. And we can just go ahead and pretend that whole prequel fiasco never happened. At long last, Star Wars is gonna produce something I can actually be proud to call myself a fan of. Oh boy, if only I knew how bad things really were. Over the next five years, I slowly came to grips with the absolute horror I was witnessing unfold in front of me. Not only were my greatest fears being realized, but it was worse than I ever could have imagined. Somehow, despite their unfathomable wealth and resources, Disney managed to fumble the bag on the most beloved IP in their entire company portfolio. At first, I didn't want to believe it was happening. After film two of the trilogy, things were looking grim. But Star Wars teaches us to cling on to hope in these very situations. So I did, for as long as I possibly could. Then one dreary December day in 2019, I walked into some godforsaken theater in Jacksonville to witness the defining franchise of my childhood meet its bitter and unforgivable end. Some people actually liked this movie. That's good for them. I didn't. 
In fact, I can confidently say that no other film for as long as I live will possibly make me feel the level of shame, betrayal, and hostility as I did in that moment. I believe it was during the scene where the heroes are fighting the heavily armed space fleet on horseback when I really started rethinking my life choices. Star Wars, as I knew it, was dead. It was something I had suspected all along, and by now, there was no more childhood naivete to cushion the blow. It dawned on me that all those years I had spent as a die-hard fan had meant absolutely nothing. I felt like such a fool for convincing myself that there would be any sort of payoff for the emotional investment I poured into this franchise. I no longer cared about the story, the characters, anything. All of a sudden, I wanted nothing to do with the series I had loved for my entire life. This movie made me hate Star Wars. It made me question why I even watched movies in the first place. After that dark day, my first love in cinema had been totally and unequivocally ruined. But luckily for me, there was another. God, there he is. Hey man, what's going on? Where you been? You haven't uploaded in months. Wait, what, what are you talking about? Your views are going down the drain. You're irrelevant. Hold on for a second. Whoa, just relax, okay? Just relax. All I'm doing is waiting in line for my favorite movie. What movie? What are you talking about? It's the biggest event of the summer. How long have you even been here? I don't know, I guess you start to lose track of time after the first couple weeks. Em, you gotta get back to work. You're gonna start losing money. Oh, don't worry about that. My money is very safe, as you can see. Uh, I don't think you should be investing in companies like- Hey, you like, like Bespoke Post? Yeah, of course. They sent me this great camping chair, the parked box. It's great for when you're, uh, camping out to be the first in line to one of the greatest movie sensations of the year. But of course, what good is camping out for the movie without some nice, delicious movie theater popcorn? Of course, I have it concealed in the middle of the, the Spoke Post Weekender travel bag. Why go through the trouble of sneaking in popcorn if you don't also have your nice little container of soda? And with Bespoke's cast box, you too can have delicious popcorn refreshment and refreshing soda to watch your favorite movie event of the year. And these amazing products and more could be yours by visiting Bespoke Post's web zone on the World Wide Web. Fill out the online quiz, and through the magic of the internet, they will ship a product of the month right to your door. And if you're a fan of coming attractions, Bespoke lets you preview your box. And if you don't like what you see, you can swap it out or skip the month entirely at no charge. I don't know, Em. It seems kind of unethical to sneak your snacks into the theater. I mean, if everyone started doing that, that might cause them to start going out of business. Well, you know, Rusty, after a while, the prices in there, they're just not a good value anymore. But where you will find a good value is with Bespoke Post. Each box contains over $70 worth of stuff, and you get it for only a fraction of the cost. I'm not gonna lie, man. It doesn't look like anyone works here anymore. Don't you think you should go back and start working on your videos? Can you stop asking completely reasonable questions? Don't ask questions, just consume product. And you can consume the product at bespokepost.com slash emplemon20 for 20% off your first box. Man, they sure do seem to be taking a while. I wonder what's the holdup. You think it has something to do with the quality of the movie industry? I don't know what you mean by that. There's been tons of great hits in the past few years. Titanic, Jurassic Park, Die Hard. It seems like the industry's doing better than it's ever been. Em, you're not making any sense. What are you talking about? Have you been living under a rock? It's the biggest movie in history, the follow-up to the most beloved trilogy of all time. Hello? Hello? I don't understand. The, the premiere is just in a couple days. Why is nobody here? Why is nobody waiting? Emp, you have to relax, all right? You're acting erratic. Everything you're saying makes no sense. Titanic, Die Hard, Jurassic Park, those movies haven't been popular for over 20 years. What did you just say? Yeah, those movies have not been popular 
for over 20 years. You can't be serious. Rusty, what year is it? Star Wars Downward Spiral can be traced all the way back to the May of 1999 and the release of The Phantom Menace, which many fans attribute as the kiss of death for the brand. Just a few weeks prior, a different sci-fi franchise had sprung to life. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. The Matrix made itself known as the surprise of the year. It burst out of the gates, setting the box office record for an April release. For a film that was only sparingly marketed, its meteoric success had seemingly come out of nowhere. Lead actor Keanu Reeves was mostly unknown at the time. Even less known were the film's enigmatic directors, the Wachowskis. Whoever they were, they'd captured lightning in a bottle. Audiences were being drawn in by nothing more than pure intrigue. The Matrix packed the theaters for one simple reason. No one had ever seen anything like it. It was ambitious, innovative, and salient. It pioneered such revolutionary techniques in filmmaking that its influence is still felt today. But what truly set The Matrix apart from the competition was its philosophical depth. For many, it represented the ultimate exploration of one of modern man's deepest fears. The year 1999 seems to come up a lot in my videos. I have come to view it as this inflection point in the trajectory of modern society, after which everything seems to have taken an ominous turn for the worse. Turns out the future ain't quite what it's cracked up to be, and while dystopian visions of tomorrow were nothing new, the one presented by the Matrix is exceptionally bleak. Human beings have forever been defined by technology. Our ability to transform natural elements into complex tools is what separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom. But somewhere along the way, tools became a little too complex, and we started calling them something else. Machines. While it's difficult to pinpoint exactly when the shift occurred, it seemed to coincide with the time when technology started to feel intimidating. This sentiment became apparent at the start of the Industrial Revolution when machines began replacing us. Perhaps the first conflict between man and machine can be traced back to an 18th century weaver named Ned Ludd, who, according to legend, smashed a pair of knitting racks in a fit of rage. By the 19th century, technology had begun to transform the entire textile industry. Skilled artisans were now being undercut by automated factories which could output similar goods at a much lower expense. In 1811, the disenfranchised started lashing out against their mechanical oppressors. Taking after the story of Ned Ludd, this anti-technology faction would soon become known as the Luddites. The movement wouldn't last long, as the military soon cracked down on the insubordination. In time, the cultural consensus would go on to look back on the Luddites derisively, viewing them as an irrational hindrance to the natural pursuit of progress. After all, automation ends up benefiting everyone else. If someone ends up losing their job because of it, they're just taking one for the team. It was easy for all sorts of people to think this way, until all of a sudden, they were the ones getting replaced. As technology continued to rapidly advance, concerns over automation began to appear in fiction. The American folktale of John Henry was notably one of the first of its kind to feature a machine as an antagonist. The legend tells the story of a railroad worker who drops dead after racing a steam-powered drill. Later depictions of our machine-powered future would only get more grim. The 1927 film Metropolis presented the first depiction of a post-industrial dystopia. It laid the groundwork for what would eventually become known as the cyberpunk genre a new wave in science fiction which expressed hesitancy to the rapid expansion of technology. It envisioned a future in which the pervasiveness of machines would oppress and suffocate mankind. While concerns of technology primarily focused on its omnipresence, others foresaw an additional threat in its intelligence. In the midst of its bionic world, Metropolis featured one of the first concepts of a bionic man, which we now refer to as robots. They represented an acknowledgement that somewhere ahead on the horizon, machines could eventually match and even surpass the capacities of human beings. 
In the 20th century, much of the pioneering literature about robots would be explored by sci-fi author Isaac Asimov. He is perhaps best known for coining the Three Laws of Robotics, which sought to address the most immediate threat that life-sized automatons may evoke, the prospect of them turning on their masters. Asimov's work was compelling, especially during a time period which gave rise to the very first computers. All of a sudden, the idea of intelligent machines was spilling into reality, although at this point, it hardly resembled anything human. The original computers were almost Lovecraftian, an incomprehensible wall of electronic components that, by some terrifying miracle, were capable of mimicking the foundational elements of thought. Contrary to their initial humanoid depictions, computers were practically formless, they could theoretically take on the appearance of anything we could imagine. The film 2001 A Space Odyssey would introduce the first landmark appearance of artificial intelligence in cinema. The cold and calculating HAL 9000 would unnerve audiences for decades to come. Director Stanley Kubrick reimagined the machine antagonist as more than a single threatening entity, rather one which served as a hostile extension of the setting itself. This idea would be expanded on further by the artist H.R. Geiger, who produced nightmarish illustrations of living things being smothered by an all-encompassing mechanical environment. In 1973, he would create one of his most notable works while collaborating with the progressive rock band Emerson, Lake & Palmer. The group was finishing their new album Brain Salad Surgery, which depicts an epic war between humans and computers. While listening through, Geiger composed what would eventually become the album's artwork, an outer cover featuring a sterile metal sarcophagus, which opens to reveal a lobotomized woman. While Geiger envisioned a physical convergence between man and machine, sci-fi author Philip K. Dick took a more conceptual approach. His 1968 novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep features human-like replicants who are practically indistinguishable from biological men. This premise would later be adapted into the 1982 film Blade Runner, where the corruptive influence of technology has expanded to threaten our perception of reality itself. By this time, computers were being welcomed into people's homes, and the advent of a virtual reality was no longer a question of if, but when. The rapid acceleration of computing power began to fuel theories of a potential technological singularity on the horizon in which super-intelligent machines could achieve godlike abilities, thus rendering all of mankind obsolete. At the same time, fictional works began to push the concept of machine warfare to its absolute limit. If a confrontation between humans and machines did arise, just how bad could things get? The Terminator franchise envisioned the human race being driven to the brink of extinction by nuclear hellfire, a somber outcome indeed but one which many would find preferable to the scenario depicted by The Matrix. In a world where mankind has long since lost its war against the machines, human beings have been forced into a fate worse than death. A state of total submission in which our homeostatic energy is harvested to power the machine world. The collective human consciousness is imprisoned and pacified by a lifelike simulation. This premise is very much reminiscent of Plato's allegory of the cave, an age-old metaphor about the nature of truth and objectivity. It seeks to highlight philosophical enlightenment as the pathway to salvation. But of course, that's to assume that whatever's waiting for us outside the cave is actually worth the journey. Coincidentally, one year before the debut of The Matrix, an entirely different film had already explored the premise of escaping from a false reality. And while we never see what happens to Truman after he breaks free of the simulation, it's implied that he's gone to a better place. In The Matrix, however, the decision is not as clear. It's human nature to seek out truth, but does there come a point when the truth is so ugly that we'd be better off not knowing at all? How many of us would choose to remain in the cave if we knew the horrors that lay beyond it? Perhaps it would be better for us to simply stay put and play it safe. But the story of humanity would indicate otherwise. It goes against human nature to remain in prison in both a cave and a simulation, for the simple reason that it undermines our autonomy. For just as technology defines mankind, so too does self-determination. The idea that we are the masters of our own destiny, 
that our decisions are the product of free will, and not some pre-programmed directive. In this way, we are distinct from both animals and machines. Human beings aren't required to behave in ways that are entirely instinctual nor logical. While computers may one day reach a level of intellect magnitudes higher than our own, it's unclear whether they will ever be able to truly think like us. Choice is unmistakably human, even if those choices often aren't the most rational. It's for this reason why Neo is such an engaging protagonist. His journey relies on regaining the right to choose, no matter the monumentality of the system standing in his way. Audiences couldn't help but relate to Neo's story, especially during a time when so many of us were losing our autonomy. The 20th century was marked by the rise and fall of totalitarian regimes. The collapse of the Soviet Union was supposed to signal the dawning of a new era in which the people of the world could finally exist as liberated citizens. The 90s were generally regarded as a time of idealistic optimism for the future, a sentiment which was nonetheless undercut by the ominous feeling that something was not quite right, that the so-called free society we were inhabiting didn't exactly come as advertised. There's a scene in The Matrix where Agent Smith explains why the machines chose to simulate the year 1999. He describes it as the peak of civilization. Obviously, the setting was intended to match the contemporary release of the film, but it's eerie to look back on that line today and realize just how true it still rings. While the machines canonically intended to pass off the year 1999 as a convincing reality, it ironically marked a point when everything started to feel artificial. The late 20th century saw the rise of a different kind of machine, the corporate machine, financial behemoths whose influence grew to rival the most dominant empires in history. These man-made entities have very much become the monolithic overlords of the present day, and they've been actively twisting the reality around us. It was hard to notice at first, everything seemed so normal, but eventually, the anomalies just became too much to ignore. Despite all the concerns of machines acting like us, no one could anticipate just how much we would start acting like machines. It's strange to consider how one of the original worries about automation had to do with it providing us too much leisure. If that was ever the case, we surely haven't seen any of it. In fact, there's an argument to be made that the average person today is doing more work than at any other time in recent history. Simultaneously, the nature of that work has only become more robotic and dehumanizing. The ruthless efficiency of the labor market has rendered individuality almost worthless. You either fit into the preordained system or you don't. Either way, you're just another cog. The fruits of your labor serve no greater philosophical purpose. You can't help but get a little existential when it feels like everything you do is meaningless. It's a feeling that now extends far beyond the office cubicle. The relentless thirst for profit has expanded to pervade nearly all walks of life. Much like the fate of humans in the Matrix, modern consumers are created and harvested to feed some inescapable system that we will never comprehend. And although we found ourselves with no shortage of things to buy, it's somewhat shocking just how limited our options have become pretty much everywhere else. If you've ever wanted to experience how it feels to be in the Matrix, look no further than the very industry from which it came. If you're a millennial, think of something from your childhood. Is there a movie or show reboot of it? Because I'm hard pressed to find anything I can answer no to. The list gets pretty depressing as you near the bottom of the barrel. Chips, Baywatch, Battleship, G.I. Joe, Power Rangers, and a hexology of Transformers movies with more to come. If you went back in time and told the world that 50% of our movies would be based on toys, they would probably just hit the button and end it. It seems like these days, everything has to be a franchise. Because while a standalone film is limited to its moment in the sun, a cinematic universe can be milked until the sun stops shining. Why allow something to die when you can keep it in a perpetual state of suspended animation, siphoning off every last drop of whatever made it so alive in the first place? The Matrix, of course, had its share of sequels, which never quite reached the acclaim of the original. While they have been criticized for being a tad too cryptic and incoherent at times, there was never any doubt over whether they deserved to be made at all. Each of them represented a clear artistic vision and continued the story in a meaningful way. They served a purpose beyond being a shameless cash grab.
2019 marked 20 years since the release of The Matrix, and much had changed since then. Keanu Reeves moved on to an entirely new action franchise. The Wachowski brothers were now the Wachowski sisters, and the film industry had mutated into an almost unrecognizable wasteland. Gone were the days of the ambitious auteurs who define Hollywood's greatest hits. Modern blockbusters now view ambition as an unnecessary risk. Turns out that film studios had become 20 years smarter at making movies profitable. The first Matrix film wound up making Warner Bros. nearly half a billion dollars at the box office, which was almost eight times their initial investment. This remarkable financial success makes it all the more baffling to consider that had it been pitched today, The Matrix would have probably never been made. I mean, if you really think about it, when was the last time any major Hollywood studio rolled the dice on an unproven concept? Could an R-rated blockbuster with such esoteric themes even exist nowadays? Cinemas used to be some place you'd go to witness something truly spectacular, but lately, every aspect of the industry has been on a steady march towards mediocrity. Twitter user Eric Krebs helped visualize the stark decline of originality in Hollywood. It's now common for the top 10 grossing films of the year to be entirely composed of recycled concepts from pre-existing source material. The superhero genre alone, which The Matrix ironically helped inspire, has ballooned to fill up nearly half of all blockbusters released. The number of R-rated films has been gutted to make way for the far more marketable PG-13, a format which neuters the filmmaker's ability to explore sophisticated ideas. The once promising field of computer graphics now comes off far more as a crutch for overworked productions who can't be bothered to compose an actual scene. The Hollywood simulation is now almost entirely dependent on machines, and the results are just as uninspiring as you may have guessed. It seems like every big budget film today, no matter who directed it or which studio backed it, now looks like the same bland and homogenous visual sludge. There is a disturbing lack of humanity in modern day blockbusters. Creative control has been wrestled away from filmmakers and placed in the hands of bureaucratic committees, who audit every decision in the production process over its financial sensibility. Anything remotely nuanced or edgy is generally not advisable. Movies are now expected to be international events, and should in no way touch on any issues that may marginally offend anyone on the opposite side of the globe. For an industry once renowned for its limitless possibilities, it's disheartening to see so much of cinema now defined by what you can't do. The craft of filmmaking has been streamlined from an art to a science. Major releases no longer feel like an organic exercise in creativity. They feel like the product of a heavily controlled formula. Much like a roller coaster, they're designed to offer the impression of a dire situation, while all along you were never in any real danger. After it's all said and done, you always wind up right back where you started. You haven't really gone anywhere. Why allow the heroes to fail? Why allow a fan-favorite character to truly die? Why allow the guy to not get the girl in the end? Sure, doing so might produce a moment that's actually meaningful, but that would imply that movies can tell a story that's even remotely complex. It's as if Hollywood is no longer capable of producing stories which are actually satisfying. They instead come off as a disparate patchwork of amusement with very little substance or cohesion holding anything together. It's like going to a restaurant expecting a gourmet meal and getting served a plate of candy. Sure, it sets off all the right receptors, but rather than making you feel full, it just makes you sick. And the sickening sweetness of movies today is delivered through meaningless nostalgia, assaulting the audience with a nauseating barrage of familiar faces, places, and sounds. Studios now go so far as to resurrect the dead just to keep the same old song and dance going as part of some desperate ploy to remind us of a time when movies actually made us feel something. Some of us aren't fooled, however. We know that we're not living in 1999 anymore, and recognize the product on screen as a hollow imitation, only resembling the original superficially. Just like a machine, it has no soul, and it replaced whatever was alive long ago. Such is the fate of the modern franchise, it happened to Star Wars, and soon enough, it would happen with The Matrix too.
These days, it seems like no entertainment property is safe from the dreaded reboot. As the pool of original ideas has dried up, Hollywood has determined that it's now far more cost-effective to simply regurgitate existing brands from a bygone era. While the uninitiated may feel excited to reunite with that special friend, it's important to realize what exactly made it so special in the first place. Surely it wasn't geriatric celebrities trying and failing to relive the glory days, nor was it a bubble-wrapped and sanitized retelling of a story we've already heard before. How about the nonsensical addition of a marketable character whose only purpose is to drive toy sales? If you ask me, the vast majority of rebooted franchises would have been far better off staying dead. They aren't interested in selling a quality product. All they're selling is a legacy. A legacy which stands to be actively tarnished by whatever vapid slop is being pumped out today. But what can I say? There's a reason why shameless pandering sequels continue to flood the market. People keep paying to see them. It's almost as if modern consumers have been conditioned to accept nothing more, to be content with middling disappointment. Reboots have become inevitable, and studios are now hungry to defile the graves of long-dead franchises. Naturally, it was only a matter of time before The Matrix was next on the chopping block. It was the end of 2019, right around the time Star Wars got sent to the glue factory, when news came out that The Matrix was next. Warner Bros. wanted a fourth installment to the series, and they were going to make it with or without the Wachowskis. The thing is, there already was a fourth Matrix film, the excellent and often overlooked Animatrix, an anthology of short stories set in the Matrix universe. It was a supplemental release that truly deserved to be made, one curated by the Wachowskis to celebrate the spirit of the originals by opening it up to the interpretations of others. The stories within were imaginative, dynamic, and stylistically vibrant. A fitting send-off to a project which placed so much emphasis on free expression. If only it was that simple. Warner Bros. could sense that the Matrix brand still had quite a bit of money left in it. Everything else was getting rebooted. Why not the Matrix? It didn't matter that the story had already reached its logical conclusion. They had tickets to sell, as well as a sleek new streaming service. The studio basically gave the Wachowskis an ultimatum. They could either oversee the spiritual death of their brainchild, or hand the job over to someone else. Either way, the defining achievement of their lives would be turned into an abject mockery of everything it once stood for. Upon hearing the news, Lily Wachowski wanted nothing to do with it. So that just left Lana, to figure out how to defeat the Matrix once and for all. So what do you do if you're being forced into a movie you don't want to make? Well, believe it or not, the wisdom of how to handle the fate of one of Hollywood's most acclaimed enterprises could be found in one of its least. And it was all made possible by, coincidentally, an unlikely hero named Tom. 1999 would mark the big break for comedian Tom Green, who landed a new show on MTV. He soon established himself as a pioneer of shock humor in the socially uncomfortable serving as the progenitor for some of the most popular comedy today. Tom was very much ahead of the curve, in more ways than one, because in 2001, he would produce something so avant-garde that we have only just begun to appreciate it. What is the most disgusting film of 2001? The champion is Freddy Got Fingered, with Tom Green making David Spade look like Jim Carrey, and Jim <laughs> Carrey look like Laurence Olivier. Accounts differ depending on who you ask, but legend has it, Tom was required to make a movie against his will due to some contractual dispute with the studio. 20th Century Fox would end up getting their movie, but the comedian would have the last laugh. The result was Freddy Got Fingered, a film so diabolically awful that it all feels like one big practical joke. Perhaps no other movie out there expresses such contempt for the Hollywood system. It literally tells the story of an artist wasting the studio's money. It's a million dollars gone. No, easy come, easy go. And while he's not exactly Neo, he is portrayed as a self-aware person trapped inside a contrived reality. At the time of its release, nobody really understood what the film was about. It went on to become one of the most critically panned movies of this century. Tom Green proudly accepted his five Razzie Awards, 
reportedly having to be dragged off stage after breaking out a never-ending harmonica solo during its acceptance speech. It just didn't make any sense. Everyone dreams of being a movie star. To be given such an opportunity should be considered a great honor. Why would someone just throw it all away like that and turn the whole thing into a laughing stock? How could anyone willingly attach their name to something so embarrassing? Well, you have to remember that Tom Green was ahead of the curve. Maybe he knew what the film industry would become and saw the way out. Turns out the best way to defeat the Hollywood machine was giving the studio the finger. Hi, this is my painting that I made. It's called Tiger Zebra. I worked really, really hard on it. Now I'm going to go put it up in the National Art Gallery because that's where all the really, really good paintings go and I want mine to be seen by all the people that appreciate really, really good art like this. In December of 2021, I returned to another Jacksonville theater fully preparing to be debilitated by another hideous sequel. But what I ended up witnessing instead was unlike anything I could have expected. In many ways, what I saw that day was very much a terrible end to a beloved franchise. From a nonsensical and immersion-shattering plot to goofy, dumbed-down characters. A film stuffed to the brim with baffling moments like Neo watching the first Matrix on a projector, pouring a container of blue pills into his mouth, and a strawberry. A strawberry? At first glance, it looked to be yet another Rise of Skywalker, but something felt different this time around. Nothing comforts anxiety like a little nostalgia. The Matrix Resurrections was a film so aggressively idiotic that it seemed almost deliberate, as if the creators were attempting to weaponize their own stupidity. And then it hit me. This wasn't just a sequel to The Matrix. It was a sequel to Freddy Got Fingered. It was a movie about not wanting to make a movie. I'm sure you can understand why our beloved parent company, Warner Brothers, has decided to make a sequel to the trilogy. Only this time, instead of wasting a paltry 14 million of studio funding, The Matrix Resurrections managed to squander more than 10 times that. If the creators did choose to sabotage the film in that way, then it may very well be one of the most expensive jokes ever told. A Matrix reboot was always going to be an artistic failure. Might as well make that failure an inside job. My name is Bugs. As in, Bunny. But perhaps you think I'm giving them too much credit. That it's just another mediocre piece of crap like all the rest. Maybe Lana Wachowski, like many directors, ran out of talent. And The Matrix Resurrections was a genuine attempt. As far as any of us are concerned, that's the official explanation. But I don't know. I'd like to believe that for once, a shameless Hollywood reboot actually meant something. That it was more than just another big fat waste of time. Make no mistake about it, what I saw that day was an undeniable train wreck. But it was somehow beautiful. Not for what it was, but for what it represented. Sitting there in the theater on that December afternoon, I felt oddly vindicated. Like all the grief I suffered from the rise of Skywalker had suddenly lifted. At the end of the day, both Star Wars and The Matrix tell a similar story. They offer us tales of a great hero rebelling against oppressive machinery. And while Star Wars was eventually tempted to the dark side, The Matrix remained defiant until the very end. It may have met a bitter fate, but it was one which nonetheless remained under control of the artist. In this regard, it was honorable, even in defeat. When faced with the death of their legacy, the creators still had enough dignity to go down with the ship. They informed me they're going to do it with or without us. And they made it clear they'll kill our contract if we don't cooperate. I know you said the story was over for you, but that's the thing about stories. They never really end, do they? We're still telling the same stories we've always told, just with different names, different faces. The sheeple aren't going anywhere. They like my world. They don't want freedom or empowerment. They want to be controlled. They crave the comfort of certainty. And that means you two, back in your pods, unconscious and alone, just like them. The Matrix Resurrections will go down in history as a commercial failure. With losses in excess of $30 million, it will forever be known as a box office bomb. 
After just a few weeks, the whole thing was almost completely forgotten, leaving behind virtually no cultural impact whatsoever. Looking back now, just over a year later, it's almost like it never even existed. And maybe that's for the best. I'd call it a worthy sacrifice. Following the discouraging reception, Warner Bros. announced that they had no plans to continue the Matrix franchise. For the time being, it's at least one set of films that may finally be allowed to rest in peace. Hopefully, this whole situation can serve as a valuable lesson to the film industry that some things are better left in the past. And who knows, there may come a day when original ideas once again reign supreme in Hollywood. But until that happens, the whole system will be in desperate need of a deboot. I go into businesses every day, and it's been my experience. These machines can be a metaphor for whatever's on people's minds. Because they're afraid of computers? Yes. This machine is frightening to people, but it's made by people. People aren't frightening? It's not that. It's more of a cosmic disturbance. This machine is intimidating because it contains infinite quantities of information, and that's threatening. Because human existence is finite. 